could take many forms, just like a circus can take many forms. We shouldn't think of them as new entities, as new creatures that are arriving. The information bridge between humans. You can't tell if the algorithm really knows you or if you're making yourself predictable and simplistic. Bienvenue and welcome to Cirque du Sound, a sonic trip brought to you by Cirque du Soleil. My name is Michel Lapriz. I'm the creative guide at Cirque du Soleil and director of a few of our shows and, most importantly, your host for today. Right now in the background, you're hearing the music of Echo. This music was composed by Jade Pibus and Andrew Thickstone. Echo tells a story where poetry stagecraft, daring acrobatics and technologies come together in a spectacle, exploring the precious balance between humans, animals, and the world we share. Our main protagonist, named Future, navigates the phases of evolution and learns that her actions have the power to shape the world. Inspired to collaborate and fueled by the power of invention, the hope of youth, and the importance of empathy, Future and her community come together to rebuild our planet piece by piece, creating a world where we all want to live. Today, we're going to discuss the power of invention and the importance of empathy. How can we continue to fuel our creativity while holding ourselves accountable for the role we play in the way the future unfolds? What would that kind of future look like? Hello, Jaron. How are you doing? I'm good. How's it going? Good, good. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. You, you work at Microsoft or you, or you did work at Microsoft, right? I have... Um an unusual role. Um, I'm called the prime unifying scientist at Microsoft. That's part of a joke because it's in the office of the chief technology officer. So it spells out octopus. <coughs> I'm, I look like an octopus sort of, and then also I'm a lighter in, look. Yeah. Uh, in the cognition of uh, cephalopods. I'm interested in that, but um, I have a rare relationship with Microsoft uh, where I have a, um, uh, freedom to speak, even encouragement to speak, even if I disagree. So I certainly don't speak wow. for Microsoft. And I um, I think because of how powerful the tech sector is, it's extremely important for there to be uh, speech and diversity from within it and not only outside of it. Mm. And indeed, outside of it uh, has is somewhat compromised because people only speak uh, through the tech <laughs> platform. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm attempting to pioneer uh, a what you might call a loyal opposition or something, some kind of a role of um, being um, as honest and open as I can be, and yet do that from inside as a, um, a way to try to influence things. Um, it's... Uh, there's starting to be a few more people doing it, and I, I think it's absolutely crucial to to I'm our um, health as a civilization and a species to be able to do that. We can't allow the technology that connects us to be itself um, unable to carry connections like that. That just isn't OK. Yeah, we, yeah, have yeah. To, we have to do better. So that's uh, so, um, you know, um, technology has more or less two meanings these days. One is the very broad meaning of learning how to do things. And uh, the other meaning is um, uh, the uh, technology that connects people, the the mm -hmm. uh, information bridge between humans. And unfortunately, uh, that kind of technology, which is tech business, what we call tech and the big tech companies and all the tech entrepreneurs and the, the, tech, the rich people who get rich on tech and all that, there's um, we're not all bad. Some of us are great, but there's a real temptation to a kind of a corruption because if you can get in between other people, that's a very direct form of 
power. It's an even more direct form of power than money. There's this incredible game going on of who gets control of the connections between people. And it's a stupid battle because that in itself doesn't get us anywhere. That doesn't help us survive. It doesn't help us to be meaningful or happy or anything else. It's just a silly power game to no real purpose. But anyway, it, it dominates human affairs right now. And that's sadly right. the way it is. Hmm. Uh, I introduce you to the audience, John, but is there something uh, else that you want to say? Because I, I love when people talk about themselves when they define with their own worlds. So oh, where, yeah. well, where I find you? myself a little confusing to follow, actually. I, I, yeah. I don't really <laughs> quite make sense as an individual. I've had a really weird life. Um, so uh, in one of my lives, um, I probably could be called a pioneer of internet criticism or technology criticism in the modern era, where I've uh, been writing about the problems with things. Um, a lot of people are familiar with me because of a Netflix show called The Social Dilemma. Um, uh, but then I have another life um, as a scientist, as a technologist. And um, in that life, I've done quite a few things. Uh, I started virtual reality, more or less. I named it and I had the first company and had the first manufacturing and the first applications. And I invented avatars uh, and many such things. And uh, wow. I've uh, done quite a lot of work with body tracking. Um, I've worked with all kinds of crazy dancers who, you know, like the Palabolus troupe in the old days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I've never with you guys because um, I've been very deeply interested in the body as a form of communication on, on many levels. Um, yeah. For one thing, um, one of our great discoveries with avatars is called homuncular flexibility, which means that your brain still knows how to live inside different animal bodies that you descended from <clears throat> so you can turn into all kinds of creatures i can give somebody a virtual tail and they can learn to use the tail with great accuracy almost immediately because uh -huh. the brain still remembers having a tail um, but we've also turned people into fantastic creatures and it's something you can learn uh and it's my belief that this kind of uh ability in the brain is where the future of expression will come from i i think we're headed into a new level of expression that's beyond language as we know it, in which we morph into everything that could happen in reality ourselves, where we just turn into things. I've been thinking about this for many decades. It's, it's usually called post-symbolic communication, and I regret that that sounds academic. It has too many symbols. No, it does not. I love it. <laughs> I love it because, because, because us at Sudus Delay, we have an, an uh -huh. audience that's international and like, We, we, we embrace every every diversity. And when you create a show at Cirque, let's say it's a touring show, it has to, it has to speak with, with the audience in, in 15 years time to like with different yeah. level of education and stuff. So I like to, I repeatedly say to our audience, we are speaking from one reptilian brain to another reptilian brain. It's, it's very important. So I, the post symbolism is, is something that I, I, I adhere to. Yeah, marvelous. I think when we watch other people during communication, we inhabit each other's minds a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, as we watch each other move, we're inhabiting a kind of their style of experiencing life and their emotions of their moment. And we're very sensitive to how we perceive one another. We're very sensitive to tiny, tiny head motion. Yep. We're scanning each other. Yep. This is something I spent a great deal of time studying. So when you watch somebody who can move in extraordinary ways, a wonderful dancer or a wonderful acrobat, I think you're seeing into possible selves that you might not experience otherwise. I think that mm -hmm. you're exploring a space of your own physical possibility. And I think that's a lot of the beauty in it. And also not just your own, but everybody's. There's a sort of a transpersonal way in which we're exploring the boundaries of what it can mean to be human. And I, uh, uh, I, I adore this sort of thing. I love going well, through this. Cir Cir Cirque is, is completely about empathy. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I like to think that we, we take a, people with just a collection of fears and limitations. And when then people notice one human being on a trapeze going just about beyond her limits, and then she reaches the limit, then 
the collection of fears transformed into one collective joy. And that's that's empathy. And mm-hmm. you, you know, whenever a juggler drops a ball, and then people <laughs> really get more involved, and then it tries again. It's pure, pure empathy. I'd like you to explain the concept of the circle of empathy and how it relates to the role technology plays mm. in the human evolution. I love that. Uh, and vice of- versa, the role that humans play in the evolution of technology. Can you speak about that, please? Sure. Uh, the circle of empathy is an idea I started talking about a very long time ago when I was quite young. It coincidentally has also become important in a totally different context in the animal rights community, but I'll talk about it in what I think was probably the original context. And it had to do with my discomfort with the way we usually think about technology, which is that we're doing technology for the sake of technology. So as an example of that, probably the majority of my friends and colleagues believe that it's useful to talk about the concept of artificial intelligence, that there's this new thing called artificial intelligence that can do the through that. Now, the actual programs are of interest to me, and in fact, the the part of Microsoft where I'm, I'm called the Prime Unifying Scientist is also the office that's funding and distributing the open AI programs like DALI and the GPT versions and whatnot. And I actually think the programs are potentially useful, but we shouldn't think of them as new entities, as new creatures that are arriving, because I think that does damage to people. And there's no reason to think that way. We can just Mm. as easily think of them as new social collaborations, where a lot of human efforts are brought together in any way, closer to the Wikipedia than to a science fiction AI entity. Yeah. Um, Now, Way back, my argument for this was the circle of empathy. And the idea is that the world's confusing and uncertain. And in order to find some way to be moral or ethical or decent at all, you draw a circle. And what's inside the circle deserves empathy and what's outside does not. The circle doesn't have a sharp edge. But Mm -hmm. for instance, you, you might put rocks outside the circle. Okay. That doesn't mean that you aren't concerned with how rocks are handled. They might have an effect on the environment or the economy, all sorts of things, but they're not, they don't get human rights. Okay. On the inside should certainly be all humans. And this is a relatively recent idea. A lot of humans used to be uh, called slaves and were outside. Mm -hmm. But we now believe in this idea of, of human rights. We don't always live up to the idea, but at least we can state it. There's a lot of things in between that get very difficult. Animals, or at least certain animals, uh, the fetus in the United States is another tremendous area of disagreement. Now, here, then, once you think about the circle of empathy, what is the reason to make it smaller? What's the reason to make it bigger? Well, liberals are the ones who want to make it bigger, and you make it bigger in order not to be horrible. The reason to make it smaller is you might become incompetent if you make it too big. If you say, I will not even kill a bacteria, I will not brush my teeth, there's a point at which it becomes absurd. So you have to find some in between. So the question is, if you put computers on the inside by calling them AI, does that do harm or good? I say it makes you into an idiot. I say, when you say a computer's smart, you can't tell if you're making yourself stupid to make it seem smart. Yeah, you yeah, can't yeah, tell yeah. if the algorithm really knows you or if you're making yourself predictable and simplistic in order to be known. But I, is- I, I, yeah, I, sorry to interrupt. Oh, I, love you. I, lo- I love your idea of circle of, of empathy because I, I feel like uh, uh, your, your society, the American society, is not so, well, some people define themselves not so much by the people they bring in the circle, but the people they, they kick out of that circle. Mm-hmm. I see like there, there's such a big cleavage right now, like cleavage we say in, in French, the, the 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 polarity is so intense and it seems to to be uh, you know the, the expression of the violence to kick people out of that like intentionally mm-hmm. I will not have empathy for you I will not try mm-hmm. to connect with you I'm pushing you out mm-hmm. of that circle it's it's uh, it's really horrible to to what you think technology has uh, enhanced that, that that kind type of behavior well you know um, technology could take many forms, just like a circus can take many forms, right? Do you think social media has Social media as a particular design definitely makes people into assholes. Yeah, um, I agree. And we understand a lot about exactly what happens. What happens is instead of being connected with people that you find through some kind of browsing or some sort of connections to connections to connections, instead there's an algorithm 
that get, creates a feed as if you were a pig in an industrial farming thing. So there's this feed that's coming at you. And the feed is calculated to try to adjust your behavior to become more and more addicted, right? Now, a lot of it comes in the feed is fine, honestly. You know, like, I like the way people do silly TikTok dances and whatever. Like, there's a lot that I actually enjoy and I think is is great. But the problem is that in order to addict you, you have to mix reward and punishment because that's yeah. how it works. That's how behaviorism works. And so the kinds of rewards and punishment you have are social. You're either liked or followed or something, or you're ignored or humiliated or something. Those are instead of the treats and electric shots that mm -hmm. used to be given to rats and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And when you're going back and forth between these things, it pulls you back to the first time that you had extreme social sensitivity, which is when you're a little kid on a playground trying to figure it all out. So you, you become regressed. You mm. turn into a little kid, and an adult acting like a little kid can be beautiful. It can mean kind of an artistic openness, but in this case, it means the opposite. It means fear and aggression, mean-spiritedness, insecurity, a total lack of empathy. And so you see people who do this starting to have just one type of personality, even if they started out with different personalities. Yeah. And the personality is this very familiar one that and we see in celebrity social media addicts when they become mean-spirited, maybe a touch fascistic, if it's okay to say that, and I guess we have to. They become hypersensitive, but also cruel. They become incredibly narcissistic, very narrow-minded, very short-term, very unable to step back and think. And, and that's a personality disorder that, that is associated with social media addiction, and it just happens over and over again. And it becomes so easy to manipulate. Yeah, those people are opening themselves up to easy manipulation. And in fact, we've seen this. The best documented example was the Russian psychological operations to try to influence elections in various places, such as the United States. That, that's been oh, yeah. well enough documented that it can't be a speculation anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you shouldn't feel bad about yourself or there's nothing to be embarrassed about. It, it gets everyone. It even gets the people who invented the scheme. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and so... I found for myself that I have to be kind of strict about refusing to participate in some things, you know, yeah. and I um, I think I benefit from it. But most people, I think if, if most people had as much access to the tech community and the tech world as I do, they would make similar decisions to me. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, few do. I, I, th I still think the only way in which technology is meaningful is it as if you think of it as sort of an art form, how does it affect the experience of people? What does it express? How does it connect people? Ultimately, that's all that is real. Nothing else is. Uh, everything else is technology for its own sake. But in art, uh, as an artist, you communicate with people. What I find uh, is, uh, le uh, less, uh, you, uh, less um, uh, positive with technology is that there's so many technologies who can manipulate you. I was talking with someone from the gaming uh, industry. Mm -hmm. We're saying that we can make we, we can make the the player do exactly what we want to do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. giving him or her the the illusion of freedom. But we completely manipulate that person. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's called the illusion of control, and it's yeah. actually as illusions go, it's one of the easier illusions to implement. It's easier than a lot of other illusions. Maybe that's why I really I don't I don't see why people play. Uh, I'm not a gamer. I, I, I tried, and I so said there must be something there, but I I just I don't feel I don't feel. I good. you know um one of the things that I like is that some of the more popular games are creative ones where people are building things, and I believe like uh, Minecraft as an example, and I think in that case, um. Uh, I don't want to say everything's perfect there, but I do want to say that something where people are more in control and making things is better than one in which they're being told, here are the rules and you have to win according to these rules. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just a quick reminder, you're listening to Cirque du Sound, a brand new podcast from Cirque du Soleil. My name is Michel Laprise. If you like what you're hearing... I hope you'll tell your friends about us and leave us a review. We would love to hear from you. Fans go 
first. Whether it's early access to seasonal deals or pre-sales, pick your tickets before everybody else. Sign up for ClubSick today and you'll be the first to hear about access to special events, pre-sales and discounts. Take a look behind the curtain and enjoy up-to-date news on all things Cirque du Soleil, including shows, artists, and latest innovations. Visit CirqueDuSoleil.com to subscribe. I want to know, what kind of future would you like to see? And how mm. do you imagine people being able to contribute to that in their everyday lives? Well, um, This is a tricky business because I think it isn't proper for us to say this is how the future should be because we have to show respect for future people and give them room. Hmm. And we can't pretend we know everything. And yet at the same time, we also can't just leave them this horrible mess. <laughs> you know, we have to, so we have to sort of foresee what a good future would be like without it being overly dictated. So here's how I would start with that. I would say, first of all, uh, I want a future in which people survive, and I want us to survive with enough of a comfortable margin that we're not desperate or hungry or miserable or sick all the time. I'd like mm -hmm. us to be comfortably um, survive, surviving, you know, and um, that didn't seem like it was a big ask pretty recently, but suddenly it's starting to feel like a big ask because mm -hmm. not so much because we have so many problems, but because we have so many problems that we're refusing to confront reasonably between uh, climate and uh, access to fresh water and medicine and uh, um, how to deal with market failures and how to deal with government and how to, uh, I mean, I could go on and on. So <laughs> We, yes. the, the thing is, since we're not demonstrating an ability to deal with problems, we'll probably have them. And um, that makes things unhappy. So I think in order to address that, we have to address a deep issue, which is that the special thing that has helped people survive thus far is the way we can share information with each other. Now, other species also share information. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to say it doesn't happen. We've seen it in bees and in Caledonia crows and all kinds of things. Yeah, like other yeah. species, but not like us. We can we can share more information in more detail and compound our knowledge and skills across generations and across the world. And it's it's it it is really different. And it's what it's all we have now. As we've moved to an era where the total connection between people is starting to be taken over by digital devices. We've moved into an era where the temptations are just great for anybody who runs the digital devices to get in the middle of things through their own power. The temptations are so great mm. that we're degrading our ability to talk to each other. We're starting to see a situation. Well, I'll give you an example. I uh, was interested in the latest images of the cosmos from the James Webb telescope, yeah. which I really love. Yeah. And If I log, if I look at YouTube and YouTube doesn't know who I am, so it's totally wrong. The first two pages are all fakes about alien stupid stuff. And you just, there's so much garbage that you can't actually get <laughs> to the truth. And that's a gigantic problem when you have gigantic problems. You know, it's, it's, it's an awful situation. So the first thing we need is a new economy that doesn't have those horrible incentives. And there's a name for a vision of this thing. It's called data dignity. It's a way for people to still have dignity in this world of data. And it probably involves not just having this big anonymous mush, but to know where data came from, to have provenance. Mm. It Ooh. probably involves either a full move to some sort of communitarianism or socialism, or if there's a market at all, to a different business model than manipulation for money, something other than what my friend Shoshana calls surveillance capitalism. So we either need to change the capitalist model or move Totally, for real, like to where you don't have to pay rent, you know. I think changing the business model is more likely. And so I've been very much an advocate of that. And that would mean a future where more and more of the economy is about things turning into creative classes instead of technical classes. Yeah. Can I explain what I mean by that? Yeah, yes, yes. Where I live in California, one of our big problems is that the fires are getting worse and worse every year. Yeah. And so... The people who keep us alive, I live on a California hill that could be destroyed by fire, 
a lot of them are undocumented workers who are running around trimming. And when I talk to them, I realize that they're working together unofficially without anybody having planned it to coordinate how they trim to keep the, the hillside from burning down. So these poorly paid undocumented people are keeping us alive. It's a remarkable mm -hmm. situation. And they don't have to, but they do. So there's no question but that at some point in the future, there'll be robots who are trimming the trees and, and managing forests. I don't know when that'll happen or exactly how, but there's no question it'll happen. Yeah. At that point, do all these people who've been keeping us alive become obsolete? Do they starve? What happens to them, right? Now, or they might move to some other thing that robots can't do yet, but how often, how many times can that happen, right? So there is a really interesting possibility there. What you have to realize is that there's no way for robots to know how to trim trees without a lot of data about what happened when trees were trimmed in different ways before. And that data came about as a result of the people who were trimming them before. So in a sense, the present day people are the programmers of the future robots. Why can't we be honest about that? Why can't they form a new kind of union and negotiate with collective bargaining to get paid for all they've contributed to the robots of the future? But that's mm -hmm. not the that's not the end of the story though. The the really good ending of the story is once we get to the point where there's tons of robots that are helping to fight climate change and improve soil and reduce fire threat, do all the things that you might be able to do. At that point, are you done? Are the people out of work then? No, because what creatives do is they come up with a new show. Uh -huh. You didn't decide after the first Cirque du Soleil show, well, okay, that's it, now we disband. He said, no, 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 we're going to do another show. We're excited and that we're we do want to continue, show. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so what they do is they say, wait a second, we're not just technical people, we're creative people. And they start saying, hey, we're going to make forests so that they turn into holograms if you look down at them from space. We're going to make incredible topiary with spirals and crazy things. We're going to put your portrait on your tree for the season or your kids. You know, we're going to do all these crazy things and there'll be seasons of style and fashion and it'll turn into an art form. Yeah, well, it's funny because just before pandemic, uh, I was reading a lot about like, oh my God, uh, how many jobs will be automated and uh, careful because your your job is obsolete and then within 10 years, you'll be replaced by the robot. And then I, after pandemic, I don't hear that at all. And there's a shortage of people. Yeah, I mean, my perspective on this is that usually the way this is talked about is can the robot do this thing or not? And if the robot can do it, then the person's out of a job. I don't see it that way at all. The mm -hmm. way I see it, is people define jobs in a way that somebody gets paid or not. And that's totally independent of whether the person is still needed in some manner, whether people are mm -hmm. still needed. So um, there's no question to me that if, let's say, if a society prioritized the well-being of everybody, but at the same time also wanted to prioritize machines doing work and people not, that we could automate a ton of jobs already if we wanted to. Instead, what we're doing is we're splitting society apart into uh, elites who are closer to the big computers and then a service class of people who are further from them. And that mm -hmm. gap is widening. And mm -hmm. so when you say, well, a lot of people want jobs, but the jobs aren't that good, you know? And so the, the, the definition of what constitutes a job has actually been defined a little downwards. And that's- Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. but that's what and, I'm saying is that now yeah. people, though, they don't, they're not there. And now we would need robots. <laughs> well, are, are no, not no, no, to but those things- jobs. So together, I mean, mm -hmm. it's when you define the job downwards that you're preparing for either somebody to come in and act like a robot or for an actual robot yeah. to come in. There's right. no reason to define the job downwards. That's what I was trying to, that's, mm -hmm. that's the purpose of my allegory about the, the, the tree maintainers. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. Instead of saying, oh, well, once robots can do it to some technical degree, then they're out of work. Instead of that, we could say, no, they're going to turn into a new, a new class of artists. You reinvent your work. Yeah. Elevate it. I don't see why, for instance, um, robotic espresso makers work, and yet we have baristas and latte art yep. and everything. Like, we can define human roles upwards instead of downwards. We can. Yep. The question right. is whether we will. So, Jaren, um, mm -hmm. so some most of the people will be listening to that podcast, but it's I think there's also like a video component. So people who can see your background as this beautiful instance instruments since you have a collection of instrument instruments i'm super we're super yeah. interested at sick so tell tell us about that well look i love instruments um 
I love instruments for a lot of reasons. Honestly, a lot of it is my mother was a musician and she died when I was little. So it's my connection oh. to her in a way. Mm. But also to me, they're the best technologies that have ever existed because I think technology is best when it's expressive. And there's no question that these are the most expressive technologies. Wow. So I have this... I'm not going to say I'm proud of it. I have an addiction to learning new instruments and I have <laughs> wow. many, many, I don't know how many, I'm not sure if it's over 2000 now, but easily over 1000. And I'm just always tracking down and learning some new weird, obscure instrument from history or some culture or something. It's a madness. Um, wow, it's probably it's not been great for my family. <laughs> what I, I, I play a lot for audiences is this, this is called a can. It's from Laos. And I play wow. it in a unique way. I don't know how it'll come across on the mic, but can I try it? Ah. It's yeah. funny because like it's it's not by accident we're talking about that because to me one of the most empathic thing is music. And, and, and just you just made us close to the last people people who, uh, who play it uh, every, oh wow how, how do you find instruments like typically you go you go in a small village and you well, ask around Yeah that one I um I was just traveling you know um when I was younger I used to find them by traveling around and then um I don't do as much of that anymore, but, um, you know, it's just true that people from all of the world are <clears throat> come to the rich part of the world. So I meet people in North America or Europe and, and I, I usually find them that way these days. Um, but, uh, but and how, yeah, you, how do you learn? You find uh, someone who still play the instruments and that person teaches you. And, and it's always different in the case of Laos. They really thought I was weird at first. <laughs> Let me just tell you, like, it was sort of like this alien showing up and saying, I oh, want to learn to play the piano. And they're like, oh, okay, here's a piano. Oh, my God, what are you doing to that piano? But um, <laughs> so it was, it was, but it's become, like I say, it's like over time, it becomes more of a two, it became more normal. Um, I usually try to learn an instrument in the original style first, but then I always try to mm -hmm. find my own thing on it. And mm -hmm. uh you know what's amazing is how many of them there are. You can keep on finding new ones. I wow. every time I think, oh my god, I've run out, and then I discover some new amazing, crazy thing, and it's just great. I, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty alien. Do, do you want well. another instrument? Yes, please. Okay, here, hold on. Here, I'm just, I'm just um, getting things that are within reach, which is a little bit of a random way to choose things. <laughs> I love the so, randomness. This is a kind of um, overtone flute that's found in different parts of Eastern Europe, but I play them uh, mm -hmm. two at a time. And there's a whole story about that. But um... yeah. <laughs> Ah, oh, my God! Thank you so much, yeah. thank you so much. We have to go, but uh, ah, it's, uh, I have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. And my God, time went so fast. Um, if if you could leave us with some sort of food for thought about the future and our place in it, what would that be? I I think we need a new kind of faith. Um, in the old days, there was this argument about should we have faith in God. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the better way to put it, it's ultimately the same question. It's not really a mm -hmm. different question, but ultimately the kind of spirituality right now is do we believe in people? Do we believe that people are special? I'll even go further. Do we believe that the human is a supernatural thing, a, a supernatural entity? Now, you don't have to, and there's no certainty. Honestly, you can believe all kinds of things equally well, but... I think given technologies that can mimic people, given technologies that can at least sometimes replace people, given technologies that can fool people, 
the only way forward is to treat people as being unique and sacred and different and better than AI programs. Like, in other words, the circle of empathy has to become, in a way, more humanistic, which some people mm -hmm. used to say, oh, you know, you're making too much of people and we're not that different from nature. But as much sympathy as I have for that perspective, and as correct as it is in, in, in an ultimate sense, in a practical sense, we have to make ourselves supernatural and special in order for the future to make sense. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Wow. <laughs> I, I want to thank you, Jerry and Lanyard, for joining me today, joining us today. I have a funny feeling that we'll have some further adventure. I just have that feeling. I think so. I think so. <laughs> thank you so much, Aaron. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. To the listeners, I want to thank you for your presence. Join us for each episode as we delve into the themes and ideas that underpin Cirque du Soleil shows. Learn more about the roots of creativity and how to keep your eyes, mind, and heart open to new sources of creative inspiration. And remember, it can come from anywhere and anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Cirque du Sound. I am Michel Apis. À la prochaine. Cirque du Sound is produced by Cirque du Soleil with technical and story production by Jar Audio. If you like what you heard today on Cirque du Sound, please subscribe, comment, and leave a review.